Most innovators go against the flow or at least are different from the masses. I'm like that and therefore this talk doesn't follow the protocols of speeches but comes from the heart. Let me take you to the 1980s. I studied marine engineering because of my interest in technologies and the adventurist inside me. I was planning to work on ships for a period of 10 years, but after three ships and having seen extreme poverty, combined with my upbringing in a social active family, I did, decided to change course and devote my interest in technologies for the poor. By the way, I observed when people ask me if I'm an engineer and I tell them that I'm a marine engineer, that many start laughing. For them, an engineer is a person with bullpen and notebook and not one who smells and gets dirty in an engine room. Anyway, I have evolved from marine engineer to a social engineer. I prepared myself by joining an appropriate technology group on a technical university in Holland, which was experimenting with a ramp pump completely made from concrete, cement. A ramp pump in such a way is very inefficient. Seeing a technology that can pump water from lower to much higher elevation without the use of electricity or fuel or without emission of greenhouse gases completely blew me away. And the idea of using it one day never left my mind. I was 23 when I, in 1985, transferred to the Philippines. I still admire my deceased parents that they did not try to stop me. Communication at that time was limited to snail mail since telephone calls and telegrams were too expensive. While already in the Philippines and on a visit to Holland many years later, I met the designer of the concrete ramp pump, an old eccentric man living in an abandoned factory with all kinds of innovations around him. He mainly worked with students whom he wanted to inspire with ideas. I was with 8 already successful with our Rampom model and told him proudly about that. But he didn't like the concept of our centralized production. He believed that villages should be able to make the technology themselves, also to be able to operate, repair and maintain it. I explained to him that our ramp pump has easily and cheap available spare parts, like an ordinary door hinge. And train local village technicians, but I was not able to convince him. I tried again, but saying that the poor also deserve good working technologies, but to no avail. Let me go back to my early days in the Philippines or Negros Rada. In 1985, I started working in a farmless program for sugar workers during the sugar crisis. Maybe some of you can remember that hunger situation. Through our group, sugar workers were able to borrow pieces of land for their own food production. The prices of sugar were so low that hardly any haciendero planted sugar. Uh, sugar cane, of course, no? In 1987, a new land reform program was started and haciendas foreclosed by the PNB and DBP were transferred to the sugar workers. I was involved in extending help to the, to the workers, formation of associations, provision of working animals, farm tools and implements. My integration in those areas gave me insights in the absence of most basic services. When asked, the people would always mention as their number one problem, easy access to drinking, household and irrigation water. But there was no chance to introduce other technologies and therefore, with three other colleagues, we formed 8 v for that purpose and registered in 1992. Already in 1990, I experimented with different models of ramp pumps on a farm near Bacolod to find out that the flap model with its main moving part, the, the door hinge I mentioned, surprisingly delivered twice as much water. With 8 v the model was further evolved. I got married to Susanna, the eldest daughter of an upland farmer. On his sloping farm of over 18 degrees, no sustainable technologies and techniques were used. It was harvesting and plowing, leaving the field vulnerable to erosion. I got very close to my father-in-law, Gregorio. Fortunately, he trusted me in bringing ideas at farmer's level. The first thing we did was to lay out counter lines along which we planted Madre de Cacao and Tanglad. 
Papa Gregorio trimmed the hedgerows monthly and put the twigs behind them to stop soil from running down. It formed races over time. I also put up my first ramp pump in a creek 50 meters below. Many technologies tried out on, at the farm at my own cost were later carried by AIDFI. I realized seemingly useless eroded sloping farms could become again productive using appropriate technologies and techniques. Even just making water available on a farm and producing one's own compost can increase production tremendously. For that reason, my passion lies in the uplands. The first thing to do with 8 feet on the ramp was to see what actual experience were already present in the Philippines. I wrote around 100 letters to universities, NGOs, government agencies, and church groups, church groups, etc., which were sent by ordinary mail. Some responses we picked up a year later at the post office. I visited most discovered installations to learn from their experiences. The first years with 8 fee were very hard, since that was still pre-digital period. There was no, interest, uh, no internet, and for research, we made use of a microfiche reader with 1,000 books on technologies or negatives we had ordered from a US appropriate technology group. That was long it for us, even though nothing could be copied or printed. Communications were also hard and expensive, and it was super difficult to find some budget for projects being on an island such as Negros. We modified technologies from other de undeveloped countries using local materials and spare parts. This included different water pumps, hydro for battery charging, biogas, windmill for electricity generation, latrines and agriculture production and processing. In terms of programs, we assisted new agrarian reform communities like we did in the past, but now integrating technologies. The ramp pump has always been there, and in fact, our flagship technology. In the beginning, it was one project at a time, since the technology was completely unknown. We would, for example, have meetings with a room full of technical people, with nobody having ever heard of a ramp pump. I don't know about this room, but after this, Siguro, you will uh, know the ramp pump for sure. The ramp pump was developed in England some 240 years ago, but despite its huge potential, never spread since it was swept away by the Industrial Revolution, where there was no concern for energy and environment. There had been some experiments with do-it-yourself models, which started at the time of high energy prices, some four to five decades ago, but those were time or budget limited and therefore never worked out. 8 feet developed its crossbreed model, combining the best of of both, meaning commercial and do-it-yourself models. Most of the programs with ramp pumps were short-lived and concentrated on the technical side. With 8 feet, however, we wanted the technology to be an instrument for further development, and therefore it was necessary to work equally on the social aspects. We developed a holistic program around the ramp pump installations. You must imagine that we enter upland communities where the villagers had to go down to the source over an elevation and long distances to get an average of only 40 liters water per day per household. Not enough for all the requirements in and around the houses. Our system would then be installed and supplied by the source through drive pipes and bring water to the highest point in the village to reservoirs and from there distributed to public faucets. Prior to the installations, a community facilitator prepares the community through the setup, registration, and training of a water association. It also involves introduction of the association to local government units and agencies, community participation in howling, actual construction, selection of local village technicians, and turnover activities. Around 70% of the officers are women, since water is vital in their daily household course. Chores, I think, no? That's, I'm a Dutch, not an English-speaking person. <laughs> All this is geared toward creating ownership over the project and with the purpose of triggering further development after the installation. 
It is also necessary since villagers have mostly previous bad experiences with unsustainable dole out projects. In 2012, things went faster for AIDFI. Of course, this is the digital period. It got the Bureau of Soils and Water Management to institutionalize the ramp pump of, as a small scale renewable energy driven irrigation technology. In the same year, AIDFI started working with Coca Cola Foundation Philippines which was looking for technologies which could help them offset the use of, of their water in the bottling plants to communities or nature. Since 2012, we have implemented some 178 village systems for waterless upland communities for Coca-Cola, benefiting over 130,000 people. We evaluated the first 100 villages and found out the technical issues could be traced back to organizational challenges. This reinforced our belief that the social component is very important. We, for example, observed that the public faucet caused issues of unfair distribution and therefore poor collection of monthly fees. Innovation is in the heart of, or in the DNA of AIDFI, also in the heart. <laughs> And the continuous search for improvements in the technical and organizational uh, aspects of the systems resulted, among others, in gasket made from recycled plastic, development of a monitoring app, and a water kiosk. Initially, we developed an electric water-powered kiosk, which, depending on availability, was supplied either by the grid or a solar panel. It contained a lot of electrical and sensitive electronic parts, and we knew that it went against the, des the design slogan we applied. The designer knows he reads perfection, not when there is anything to add, but no longer anything to take away, or in short, simplification. The kiosk we piloted, but started to experience all kinds of troubles. It was too complex and for sure would create a lot of challenges in future local maintenance. Sigurado ang Lazada at Shopee hindi mapunta sa mga rural, uh, far-flung communities we are serving, no? impossibly. Mahirapan kami sila pa. No? For a long time, I had a concept in mind around a mechanical coin acceptor, such as used in gumball machines. I hope it doesn't drop. Be careful. Coupled with a flush system of toilets. This is just a spare part, a gasket or a from a flush uh, from the toilet, no? We ordered a few samples uh, of the acceptors from China, designed for the new piso coin, and started working out the concept during the COVID period. It took a few modifications since the system uh, could still be cheated. Finally, a spring system solved that, and the first units were installed in Negros and Leyte. The kiosk releases 20 liters for one peso coin. The results have been astonishing. It not only uh, solved unfair distribution, since the water a villager wants, the more he wants, the more he pays. And it helped increase the income of the associations by four to, uh, three to four times. This ensures a sufficient budget to pay for the allowances of the technicians, spare parts, expansion of the projects, and other kinds of development. Later, we added plastic tokens of the same size of the new piece coin. This allows poorer communities to even lower the price of 20 liters water. The kiosk won already a design award here in the Philippines and in Japan, a third prize in the Philippine Water Challenge, and now, much better, the Mansmith Award. Awards are great in several ways. It boosts the energy of those involved to go on, since development work is not always easy. And it brings the technology under broader attention. The mechanical water kiosk further perfected our community water systems. Again, imagine an upland village where the volume of water of, for each household increases by 10 times. Less time and money is spent for fetching, kids no longer needing to skip classes, no more water diseases, waterborne diseases, lessened skin diseases, less neck and spinal problems, improved sanitation, opportunities to grow vegetables and raise animals, do laundry near the houses, cleaner houses, and possibilities for water-related livelihoods. 
and for the community through the water associations increased income from the kiosk to realize the further development. As of today, we have implemented systems in 600 previously waterless upland villages benefiting some 300,000 people. We also carried out technology transfer to Afghanistan, Nepal, Colombia, and Mexico, and are looking for funds to do the same to Ethiopia. Kayapanyo. To, uh, to end a few thoughts about the context in which innovation takes place here in the Philippines. How can we get young people involved in designing and innovation here rather than working as OFW? In a sea of poverty, there is a sea of opportunities, maraming opportunities at Pilipinas. How can we create more stimulations rather than restrictions? Can we, for example, apply flexible standards to different levels or status of enterprises? Right now, very high standards are being applied, causing even an underground economy. Last na lang, how can the transactional mindset of many in government be transformed? So those are common questions for us as innovators for today. Salamat po. Um, if you don't mind, let's start off with asking, what's eight fees? So we just don't, I know it's an acronym for something, so we better we can appreciate yeah. and how we can also participate in helping eight fee out. Yeah, so that it stands for Alternative Indigenous Development uh, Foundation Incorporated. The indigenous is both indigenous communities or rather just common far-flung areas and indigenous technologies that are built on you know, with modern uh, spare parts and, and I so see. On. Yeah. And this is an NGO based, it, this is an NGO that you put up many years ago, is that right? Yeah, I'm the last, the Moicans, we were four. <laughs> I'm uh, the only Dutch and uh, we have 30 full-time staff. We all own together the whole organization. That's also maybe the uniqueness in the, in the business model uh, because we want to create uh, or we stimulate the communities to really take the ownership over the over the projects in the systems. And how can we do that? How can we bring that kind of uh, enthusiasm in the community if we don't feel ownership over our, our own programs? The same with sustainability. If you want to create sustainable systems, sustainable villages, we as NGOs should not depend on just funding, but also try very hard to be professional and uh, sustainable. Because NGOs in the past, uh, we, we never were at that, we never followed that path. We were different all the time. So that's another innovation that you had. It's usually the grant model for NGOs yes. with regard to financing. And yours was, what is the business model for your NGO to sustain it? Uh, the people who need the technology are the, mostly the poorest of the poor, so they cannot uh, afford the infrastructure. We don't also pay, for example, uh, for the directly for the water pipes and so on. So. Uh, water is also a right. So the funding has to come from other people. We uh, do the technology, we have everything in place. And uh, yeah, that can be governments because uh, yeah, there are targets to reach uh, water to everywhere. Everybody should reach or have water by 2030, the social development goal. Mm -hmm. So uh, we work with different stakeholders. And we never run short of cash, actually. We work very hard. Even the COVID period, many did not survive, but we, we survived, yeah. But congratulations to that. And another good thing is uh, we, we talked to the poorest of the poor. We're also very happy that one of your fellow awardees is a card MRI. And hopefully, yeah. you'll have a chance to talk to Dr. Alep and figure out also some synergies as well uh, I, to support the poorest of the poor. Have you worked with them before? No, I met him a few days ago because we, both organizations are Ramon Max Awardees. Yes. We, we were there. Uh, excellent, excellent. So this is really a great opportunity. I think what Josiah and Chiki have provided for us is a chance also for the fellow Mansbit awardees to see how they can collaborate and come up with new yes. innovations and synergies here. Here as well. Yeah. Now, uh, I hope you don't mind. I'll take you back a couple of more years. And you, you said that you were on the ship and you saw what inspired you was actually extreme poverty. And that's what brought you into helping, uh, helping, helping provide technologies for the poor. May I ask why you saw the Philippines as an opportunity for, to, to be a place where you could solve extreme poverty with technology? 
It, it could have been in other place, but coincidentally, I was also with uh, Filipinos as seamen at, at that time already on the ship. Uh, I stayed several weeks in the Philippines. I also came back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, it could have been in another country, but I was uh, attracted to the Philippines. The, the rest I will write, I hope to write one time in a book and then... No, but it's a long story. Fantastic. So that's yeah. why you chose the Philippines eventually. Yeah. Um, now, since we're talking about the Mansmith Innovation Awards, really looking at the process of innovation and how we can also recreate the lessons that you've gained uh, to develop your own product. And what I find interesting about the innovation that you did now, if you look back at the first step model, was you challenged the assumption of how water should be distributed, basically. And that's what the ramp, that's what the ramp pump model eventually did for you. But the other thing that what I find interesting, it's not not, it's not just a product innovation that you had. It was also a social innovation at the same time. Product innovation, we, we pretty much understand very well. I mean, that's, that it was a process of iteration to get to the crossbreed model. But tell us a bit more because what I find more challenging and more interesting is the social innovation that you had to bring into the model of making it work. Discuss with us a bit more how you came across you know, developing the solution, the, the social innovation. What was the pain point and then you eventually came to solving it with the social innovation? Yeah, the, of, first you always concentrate on the technology, of course, because that, that's your direct uh, challenge. And it had to be really on... Uh, uh, based on local parts, uh, local materials and parts. We wanted to manufacture the pump also to create uh, jobs in the Philippines, especially at that time, Negros had only the sugar industry. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was nothing else in the pre-digital period. Uh, then we realized, of course, that the areas we worked in were really far flung. So technically that was okay. But also the people had to take the, yeah, the ownership, huh? they really the feeling that it was their project. And uh, uh, in the same time, they had the experience. You, you would, if you would have a uh, first orientation, you come in in a village, first of all, they don't believe that the ram pump can bring it up without electricity and fuel. Even somebody will say, I will chop my finger if you can do that without motor, no? So they just believe the technology, but then that's okay, we demonstrate that. Then you have a lot of uh, male who are at the side and they are very cynical and, then, and they have a lot of experience. We have seen that everywhere. Like there are already structures uh, from the government, for example, or for politicians, m mostly done during uh, election time. <laughs> and so people are very cynical about projects. So first you have to prove that you are there, that they built a trust and that, that they really need to take the ownership over the technology. Then, okay, if the sense of ownership is there, but if, it's, if the financial part is not okay also, that, that's where the kiosk came in, then you are, uh, it, it's still not going to work because there are a few very enthusiastic asso uh, association officers, but if there is not enough money, the, for example, a technician has to go down, let's say 150 meters over a difficult path, especially during rain, rainy mm -hmm, season. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then people are still just complaining. People like just to complain in rather than to be positive and constructive. So if you don't have also an allowance, they have the heart, but you, they have to also to be compensated. So it's a whole package. If you don't have that complete, it's going to fail somewhere, somehow. I see, I yeah. see. So again, no, that's what you said, you're a social engineer at the same time <laughs> and not just an engineer. And again, no, one of the insights I just gained over here is that when developing technology or product innovation for, uh, for the marginalized, there's also a very strong social component that must come together with it. Having said that, uh, I just have two more questions before we finally close. No? But then you talked a, lot about, talked a lot about technologies for the poor. What insight have you gained if we start developing products when you have extreme poverty in mind. Like you said, no, let's not look at it as an area of, let's look at poverty as an area of opportunity for us. And we're seeing that the biggest opportunity is to, to address extreme poverty. What should we keep in mind when developing innovations for the poor? What insights have you gained? Uh, yeah, we have to really understand, of course, uh, but I'm, I like to walk. If I'm in Manila, I walk a lot of kilometers. Yesterday we came from a big Coca-Cola event. We walked seven and a half kilometers. Seven and a half kilometers. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's, that's a small distance. <laughs> uh. but, but you smell, you see, so it's a lot of observation. If you really want to develop things for the poor in, in rural communities, you have to completely understand them. Because we, we assume, no? We assume that we know what they need. Mm -hmm. 
well, a mobile phone, we never thought, of course, that would reach, uh, but, but that, had, that has spread everywhere, even mm -hmm. in Africa. So that's why we also can uh, incorporate that in our uh, program. We do uh, monitoring with the monitoring app, for example. So yeah, it's really observing and it is uh, really involving the, the people. In our organization, that's also our business model. And this is similar to, to CART. I saw that in the interview this morning in Inquirer. CART has also ordinary people in the board. We do that also. We have a general assembly. All the regular staffs are there. And it's up to them. We don't prepare, you know, like we have to get him inside or her inside. We just leave it. So we can have a driver inside. We can have... The important is that you have people who are part of the decision making, who really know what is, go what is happening on the ground. And then, yeah, that, this can be applied to uh, anything. No, I, have to say, I really like that insight right now. When you look at the, our usual board of advisors, you never get the client on I mean, it's like you never get the client or I, I run a food merchant, so I should get like one of my food merchants to actually sit on the board. So the decisions I make are not something that goes over their head or something that they don't accept because it might sound good from a bird's eye view, but on the ground, it, does, it won't work. Or even from authority. I mean, uh, there were a lot of NGOs. It's, it's not, it's not the, uh, a lot of mga padri and madri were also on board of NGOs. I'm not against madri and padri. That's not the <laughs> point. But they have an authority. And then many tend to look at their authority if they are in a, in a board and they, will, and then they come up with a wild idea. You, you are working on a lot of things, you have a direction, you know what is needed on the ground. And here comes somebody who has a new wild idea which does not even fit at all. Maybe it fits somewhere in the mission, but maybe you are no longer focused. And then everybody would say, maganda yung idea, padre, or something, or madre. So uh, that's what we try to avoid. Also, we have affiliates. Also, uh, what is dangerous if you only have an in crowd in your board, and then you don't see or you get other uh, neutral opinions. So we also have a few affiliates in our board. We balance it. We have six from our own, and we have three from outside. So they will always also check us, correct us, and they are also very enthusiastic. They come also. So it's like think out of the box. They're also like fiscalizers. They when they come, they're like fiscalizers when they come in. Correct. And the last question, which I found extremely interesting, and the insight that I got from you was that the importance of simplification. In, in, innovation can also mean simplification. Let's, start, let's, let's end with that question. Share with us a bit more of insight from uh, innovation can be all about simplification. Yeah, the sample is it's a, it's a very old technology. We, uh, I installed uh, one time a pump in Japan and I found one on that same farm and nobody understood it. What, there were so many parts inside that nobody understood it. So. And the Japanese could no, could no longer just simple, or they don't want to think of a door hinge as the main uh, moving part, you know. So we have the, we look at that the poor. What I said was they also uh, deserve, uh, they need also good working technology. And so yeah, um, it's it's all also on the the what we said like the designer knows it has reached perfection, you never stop thinking of what can still be taken away. For example, the ramp pump had uh, rubber gaskets, which you can also easily buy in a hardware, but we found out that the high pressure could blow them out from between bolts and so on, and we started recycling them from old cups of Coca-Cola bottles, Wow! and we produced the machines to do that, and they are very sturdy. But also the, the local technicians or the villagers, they found they are very innovative. They are very innovative themselves because they are far away from uh, hardware and so on. So, so they have their own innovation. Our people have our own innovations. Yeah, everybody. It's, it's uh, inside. And then my disponering, they are used to disponering. You mga Japanese lang limbawa, they don't know any longer to think simple, diba? Because yeah. all the... High tech is there. Yeah, I would think of it, but it's discarte. Discarte. Yeah, discarte. That's discarte. And with that, a round of applause, please, for Mr. Aoki Zenga. Thank you so much, Aoki, for sharing your story. I was truly, truly inspired. And if you want to work together with Aid Fee, you know how exactly how to do that. Maraming salamat. Maayo maayong salamat. Thank you so much. A round of applause, please, again.